Hi everyone, I'm Brandon Baker, Vice President of Development. I'd like to welcome you to our first RAND 2020 event. Our goal with our RAND Remote Event Series is to provide you with opportunities to stay connected to RAND while we remain physically distanced. These conversations bring our experts and their expertise directly to you. So far, 2020 has been a time of great uncertainty, a painful time in this country and throughout the world. But as RAND's president and CEO, Michael Rich has said, RAND's experts excel at extracting clarity from confusion. It's what RAND was designed to do, to use rigorous and objective research and analysis to help solve the most difficult, controversial, and complex problems. Now, more than ever, we need RAND's recommendations so that our decision makers and leaders can take action informed by evidence. We're grateful that you've tuned in today to hear more about RAND's research on artificial intelligence, its promise and its pitfalls. After a 20 minute presentation, we'll have 20 minutes for Q&A. You'll have the opportunity to ask a question of our speaker using the question feature on your screen. You can submit a question at any time during the presentation and we'll take as many questions as possible afterward. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Oshande Asaba, an information scientist here at RAND. He has a background in the design and optimization of machine learning algorithms, and he's applied his expertise to areas such as health, defense, and technology policy. His recent work has focused on the implications of artificial intelligence and machine learning, including issues of data privacy and fairness in AI systems. Oshande also co-directs RAND's Center for Scalable Computing and Analysis, and he's a professor at the Party RAND Graduate School. Welcome, Oshande. All right, um, let's dive right into it. So, um, a month ago or so, my colleague and I wrote an op-ed in which we were arguing about the ways of regulating facial recognition technologies. Now, these are technologies that are made up of machine learning models used to enable automatic recognition or identification of faces. Now, there are lots of regulatory and civil liberties concerns with these, with these uh, technologies, the most obvi obvious of which is this issue of privacy and surveillance. So we have a situation where these, the use of these technologies can strip citizens of their privacy at massive scale. Now, without the careful use, the careful deployment by the state of these things without checks and balances, we have a situation where the use of FRTs or facial recognition technologies can violate due process. Now, the second concern that I, I will also try to emphasize, we try to emphasize in our, in our op-ed, was the issue of fairness and bias. Facial recognition technologies, they are based off of artificial intelligence models, and they, these have been shown to perform worse on people of color, specifically on women of color. In fact, a prominent researcher in this field, uh, Joy Bolamini, she demonstrated how Amazon's facial recognition model was incapable of recognizing that Oprah Winfrey was a woman. Now, the, the problems with the technologies, they are pretty clear, but they are not the issue. The issue is really something different. Like, think about it. As individuals, you and I, we have had to deal with false technologies in our day-to-day -day lives. Imagine at home with your DVR remote controls, those really complex, annoying little things. Or, or another example would be when you are using your predictive texting mechanisms on your, on your cell phones. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's had experiences where you end up typing something you didn't mean to. So what is the difference between our personal use of faulty technologies and the state use of faulty technologies? We argued, and we continue to maintain, that it all boils down to a question of power. The state, by some definitions, is the exclusive legal monopoly on the use of force. We can contrast that to commercial companies who were on the Hill yesterday trying to argue that they are, they are practicing with non-monopolies. But the difference, the key difference between a commercial, a powerful commercial company whose products touch our everyday lives and sometimes shape our behaviors, and the state, is that the state ends up making decisions, ultimate decisions, 
on questions of life or death. This, the use of faulty technologies in these operations, in, in prosecuting the state's mandate, it has real dire consequences countered in a number of lives lost unjustly. For a modern concrete illustration of this dynamic, we need look no further than China and the use of high power technologies in developing state surveillance or in developing Uyghur camps. So, however much we trust governments, we have to think very carefully about the deployment of, of powerful yet false technologies in service of the operations. And our focus in, in this discussion, in this application of artificial intelligence to governance, has to be the accountable use of powerful technologies in operations. The prices of mistakes or even abuses are too great for us to ignore. So my, my goal for this short conversation is to, to do two things. First of all, I'm going to try to highlight the ways in which artificial intelligence can fit into governance operations. And my second goal will be to shine a light in, on the ways in which the use of artificial intelligence in governance can lead to problems with accountability, due process, fairness, privacy, and the like. But first, let's try to scope our terms. We have this really complex thing that we think about every day nowadays, this thing called artificial intelligence. Uh, there have been multiple approaches to try to define it. Um, some people might take the, the descriptive approach of this, where they say anything that does deep learning, Bayesian belief models, that's artificial intelligence. Another approach might think about it in terms of the functions that the AI models are trying to achieve. So if you think about Marvin Minsky's approach to defining artificial intelligence, he says they have to be able to do search, search for solutions to problems and the like. For this conversation, those alternative ways of defining artificial intelligence, they're sort of moot. They don't really get us what we need. I'm going to suggest that we focus on this approach, this mental abstraction for defining artificial intelligence. I'm going to suggest that as we think about the use of artificial intelligence in governance, the, the useful and effective mental model is one of disembodied expertise. That expertise can be imbued upon these artificial systems, either through examination of lots of training data or by talking to lots of experts and, ex and distilling from the expertise the rules of operation. The overarching frame, though, is one of just disembodied expertise, an artificial system that, that is imbued with disembodied expertise. You can already start thinking about the problems with with the use of this type of models in decision making. We have issues with accountability. How do you trust a thing that's not a human? How do you get a thing that's not a human to explain its reasons for making decisions? That type of thing. So we'll talk about those later on. With this mental ab abstraction, we can think about artificial intelligence, multiple generations of artificial intelligence. This is not the first time we've had to deal with AI in decision making roles. In fact, over the past 80 years, we've had multiple incarnations of, of artificial intelligence. Um, I will focus on two styles of artificial intelligence, the first being the last generation, the previous generation of artificial in intelligence based mostly on rule based AI. So we talk to an expert, we have knowledge engineers interacting with experts to figure out what makes their decision making work effectively in a domain. And we capture those in the database and put it in a computer. And that's an expert system AI. The modern generation doesn't really require that approach. All it requires is a bunch of data, as much data as you have about decision making context, and it will learn through a bunch of fancy mathematics and statistics to replicate the proper, most predictive, most accurate um, um, process for making decisions. Um, so we can think about a couple of contrasts between the previous generation and the current generation. Uh, we need a teacher for the old generation. For this generation, we just need data. Um, when you think about how the rule-based system works, what are its comparative advantages? It works very well in domains for which you have uh, very rule-bound decision-making. So things like medicine, things like the law. Um, the modern generation works both in that setting and in other cases where the the model of decision making is is while objective objective is the wrong word 
while stable is inarticulable. As long as there is data, you can learn to replicate that decision making process. Uh, if you think about the way the rule making AI worked back in the day, you can imagine what made what domains it failed in. The primary domain being natural language processing. Here at RAN back in the 80s and the 70s, we had a lot of researchers working on natural language uh, processing for automatic translation of things like Russian text. Uh, we have seen a resurgence of that type of work with the modern approach to artificial intelligence, and that has produced a lot more success. All right. So with this basic understanding of AI or machine learning, Let's think a little bit about how that fits into governance operations. I'm going to illustrate the next few scenarios based off of work that's been done here at RAND or is in progress here at RAND to give you a sense of what is possible. So we have these disembodied expertise models. We can use them for making better predictions as long as we have good data to tune the model. So the, the framework is we have a bunch of labeled data out in the field that tells us how decisions can be made or should be made in a particular domain. We use that data to train our statistical models. And over time, after a few iterations of training, we test the behavior, the ability of those models to predict accurately. So this is an example of, our, of an evaluative mechanism, the confusion matrix. And then once we are satisfied with the behavior of this model tuned on data, we deploy it to make decisions, for example, recognizing faces. That simple model of work, that simple process of, of deployment can be applied in other things besides facial recognition. You can think about any domain for which you have to make continuous predictions, for which you have a history of predictions, of good predictions, and use those past predictions as data to feed into a machine learning model to teach it how to make further, further decisions. Uh, we've used this in, at RAND to improve our ability to, to do logistics. For example, we help the government think through how to predict when parts are going to fail. Uh, we've used it, we've done proofs of concept in which we try to understand, uh, use these models to try to understand how people progress through, through um, their military careers. Um, more recently, we've been using these models to, to work on, on large online databases. So large online databases of behavior, things like uh, social media data. So for example, a recent project demonstrated the ability of these types of predictive models to identify whether a person on Twitter is a bot or not. Um, the data for these types of predictions, for these types of models, it's everywhere. Um, we have about 1.2 petabytes of data now on the internet. That's just growing. As long as we can use some of that data to to, to train for decision making, we can imagine the field of these types of the uses of these types of models expanding. Another way in which this might the AI models can fit into governance is for better decision support. So recently we showed that you can use uh, a model interfacing with a simulator to learn to suggest better decisions in the mission planning context. So we can think about the previous discussion about as learning from data. Here we are having a model learn to make better decisions by interfacing with a simulator. Uh, this would be, uh, the, the idea here would be to create a semi-supervised model, as we, as, as we call it, to generate decisions that can then be produced or, or presented to a, to a commander or to a decision maker and the idea is that these models will learn to subselect based on decades of experience, equivalently decades of experience with the simulator, such that when the commander chooses, he's choosing a pretty good solution to the scenario presented. You can take this further, this, this learning from simulation data, and think about, okay, how do I, how do I regulate an entire economy? How do I come up with the best policies for an entire country? And you can say, OK, I come up with a simulation of the entire country and I create an AI model that learns what, what levers work best. Now, this is probably not going to work as robustly as one might think, um, but this approach also allows a, a limited version of this, of this approach allows us to think through how, how populations might react to policies. 
So it gives us a way of understanding the downstream consequences of policies. Uh, another approach is this idea of uh, forecasting in international relations. So in this case, we have we've talked about learning from data, learning from simulators. Here we're trying to train these models on the basis of interactions with human expertise. So there are a bunch of professors, academics, decision makers who have built up a wealth of knowledge on how international relations work. Our goal is to interact with these experts, learn from them the rules of the game and create a simulable model, simulable expert, expert systems model that allows us to understand what are the likely outcomes 10, 15, 20 years down the line if this set of conditions hold in the current day. Um, of course, they're not going to be perfect predictions, but they give us a sense of what is likely to happen forecasting from today. OK, so that's a high level discussion of how things might work, how AI might fit into governance operations. But then we have this issue of should we even be doing this? I started the talk talking about how the use of powerful models in governance raises issues around the, the question of power. Should we allow governments, governance operations to make use of powerful models in their, in, in their work? Um, let's, let's dig into why we might not want that to be the norm. First of all, these models, these disembodied models of expertise, they are not normatively perfect. They don't, they don't make decisions in the same way that humans might make decisions. They don't necessarily reproduce in their decision making the values we care about as a society. Um, a couple of ways in which normative imperfection can, can seep into these models. We have the issue of when you create a model, you're trying to optimize a, a goal, optimize a cost, optimize a reward. How you frame the cost that a government should optimize or, or an operation should optimize determines what you end up optimizing. And sometimes we get that question wrong. We optimize the wrong things. We don't always want to minimize costs. Sometimes we want to maximize welfare. Also, when models are trained with, with that in, in the artificial intelligent mode, they often train on the basis of data or of rules. The underlying assumption in that, in that process is that that data is a faithful representation of the real world. That is often not the case. Sometimes it's a simplified, naive picture of the real world. And if we make decisions on the basis of that naive picture, we might get into trouble. And oftentimes we have trouble understanding the limits of the outcomes that these models predict. When do the predictions hold and when are we in a different context? The other perspective that should give us pause or give us concern or make us more careful about the deployment of artificial intelligence and governance is the fact that these models don't exist in a vacuum. They are embedded in larger systems, larger agencies, larger institutions, and just having a, a perfect, a normatively perfect, even if, if we could ever do that, a normatively perfect machine learning model in one sub part of the system doesn't mean the whole system gets better. And there are some times where the use of machine learning models in different parts, aspects of a decision making system can lead to violations of due process, which we care about as a society and governance. For example, this is a notional picture of a notional layout, an incomplete notional layout of the criminal justice system in the United States. Facial recognition is just a very small part of law enforcement. You can think about facial recognition and all those similar types of machine learning models fitting in other parts of the system. The other thing that's important to notice is even if we swap out as many decision making points with machine learning models, and if those machine learning models, even if they were perfect in everywhere we can imagine, doesn't necessarily mean that the entire system works perfectly that the entire system is normatively aligned. We can have a system made up of perfect decision makers that still goes awry. This is the question of systemic justice. And usually this comes up because the models are trained, they are fair models, fair in quotes, models trained on a culture of or history of bias. So we need a new science, and this is where RAND fits in. RAND has a history of thinking systemically about decision making processes. 
and we have taken that approach to thinking about fairness and machine learning in the as governments you begin to use these models more and more so uh, the goal was to give you a flavor of how ai can can fit into government governance operations give you a flavor of the ways in which the use of artificial intelligence and governance might cause problems and start thinking, give us a, a, a way of thinking about how to address those concerns. Um, yes, AI can be used for governance. It's very valuable for certain operations, um, but it doesn't necessarily. It doesn't necessarily solve the old problems of decision making in institutions, and in fact, we have to deal with the fact that we are deploying powerful models, powerful machine learning models in service of a very powerful um, agency, the government, the government. And we need to think carefully about when that is acceptable, what types of safeguards you can put in place and the like. All right, with that, I'll stop. Hopefully you get some questions here. Oh, Shande, thank you so much for sharing your research with us. You know, new technologies are disrupting our institutions, but how we rethink and retool those institutions for the world we live in today that's a focus at RAND. It's one of our priorities of our Tomorrow Demands Today fundraising campaign. I encourage you to look to learn more at campaign.rand.org. Now let's get to some of your questions. I see we have some waiting for us here. Um, so Ashande, you know, you talk a little bit about at the beginning, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, the data that informs AI. Could you talk to us a bit more about where that that data comes from? Yeah, so much of that data, as I, as, I, as I briefly mentioned, comes from online platforms. The, the more platforms we have, the more sources of data we have on decision making and behavior. Uh, lots of agencies also keep records of past decisions, and that can be used for, for training up machine learning models. But yeah, the online data ecosystem is, is the primary source of most of this data. Lots of language data, lots of image data, and that's only growing. It's currently at 1.2 petabytes. It's probably going to grow exponentially for probably our foreseeable lives. So. No, thank you. Yeah, and we actually have some other questions here too. Um, you know, talking about machine learning, do some machine learning models work better than others? when it comes to generating unbiased outcomes, would it make sense to create something like fair, a fairness rating to compare levels of bias in different approaches? Yes, so this this touches on some of the work we've done. Yes, you can, you can create machine learning models to be fairer than other comp competing models, as long as you have a clear sense of what it means to be fair and that that conception of fairness can be implemented in statistical equations or mathematical equations, which you can then enforce in the training of these machine learning models. Now, uh, in a sense, the difficult part is not the enforcement or the making of the machine learning models fair. That is difficult, but it's not, it, it's complicated, but it's not complex, as some people might say. The really complex part of the equation is figuring out what is the right norm, the right fairness norm to apply to a particular decision making context. Um, one of our reports, a recent report from last year, explored three different cases of decision making, one in auto, auto insurance price, another one in uh, recruitment practices, another one in the criminal justice system. And in each of those three systems, you have different fairness norms that guide what should be considered fair decision making in that context. Um, sometimes it's really clear, especially when there are laws that say this is what it means to be fair, but there are lots of domains of decision making in governance and in, in the commercial world and in our personal lives where what it means to be fair is not clear. That's the first question we need to answer. And once we have that, the, the models, the approaches for making machine learning models fair, they are they're not set in stone, they're not fully established, but there's a lot of progress and maturity in them at this point. Thank you. Yeah, let's talk a bit more about the human aspect here. So AI, you know, obviously you talked to us about this. It's a tool used to help people make decisions in various areas. But when is the human aspect or an expertise considered or when does it come into play? That is a very important question. Um, I framed our, our understanding, the abstraction we use for AI here as a form of disembodied expertise. Uh, that Disembodied expertise works only so far in decision-making context. 
sometimes we don't just care about getting the right answer. We care about how the what constitutes the right answer, first of all. So the humans get to decide what is the value they're going to optimize. And we also care about the process for getting to that right, right answer. So there are lots of restrictions in the law on uh, due process in the criminal justice system and in some parts of, um, of um, employment. So oftentimes we can't just rely on machine learning models to, to, to properly reflect what we care about. That's where the human aspect comes into play. So oftentimes it's not a matter of machine learning models replacing a human decision maker. It's a, it's a matter of machine learning models working in concert with a human decision maker who specifies the values that matter, who specifies what, pro, what due process means in that, in that decision making context, working together to make for more efficient um, operations, uh, however we define efficiency. So yeah, the human generally is really setting the rules of the game and trying, and in, a, in an ideal situation, trying to use machine learning models to improve the ability to do the work better. Great, we have several questions on bias actually, but let's start with this one. What inequities are you thinking might be baked in an AI model? Well, let's start with the data. So there is a whole process for training these models. If we focus on the modern version of artificial intelligence, they are all based on data. Uh, the data used to train these models are not necessarily a perfect representation of the world in which they are, the models will be deployed. And what happens if you want to think about the statistical the statistics involved here, the more data you have on the right, on the sub, on the different sub-demographics, the more likely you, you are to get accurate predictions on those sub-demographics. So if your data set is not representative of the background population, then you're going to have a model that uh, that's essentially baking in unequal error rates, unequal accuracy rates on the different sub-demographics. So that's just one way in which in which um, we have bias baked into the data. But you also have this issue of framing effects. Um, the way the way so the way people the way people look from their data data exhaust, if you want to call it that, differs by culture. And if your entire model is not able to recognize different cultural contexts, you're going to have a form of bias built in built into that. Um, I think the bias angle is the easiest one to angle to, to explain, but there's also um, there are a bunch of other ways in which you have bias baked into, into models. Great, let's take this question actually from Hormad's uh, Godry. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Are there efforts underway to combine rules based approaches and machine learning approaches? Yes, there are. Yeah. Um, I, I, I am trained my 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 very first papers in academia were on fuzzy systems as a form of artificial intelligence. Uh, my former research group continues to really pursue that line of research. Uh, so they work on ways of making models more explainable by um, training data driven models and and rule driven models on the same task and using the rule driven models to try to come up with a form of a, a, a style of interpretability for decision making. Uh, it's not. It, it is that that hybrid approach is is still nascent. It, it's only in the past five years when questions of machine learning explainability became um, more and more salient that the, the research in that field has ramped up. We have um, researchers thinking of uh, yeah essentially doing a backward interpretation of, of machine learning models using rule based models uh, yeah that's i think that's where most of the research on the hybrid approaches is going to going these days great thanks for that jason writes in sounds like ai is typically being used as incremental reform in place of actually addressing systemic transformation do you feel we need to solve the, at the systems level before deploying such powerful technology? Mm. Well, that's a, that's a question of political philosophy in a sense. Um, do you go for incremental reform or do you um, dismantle the system and we, we reformulate from scratch? Um, I don't have a clear answer that will satisfy Jason, I believe is the, is the questioner. Uh, but I, I, I do think that um, if, if the primary thing if the primary thing we are centering in our efforts to to make governments better, to to improve the welfare of people, is the pain that people suffer nowadays, then 
it, it makes sense to use ML models or anything that improves the efficiency of different operations of government to reduce the pain of people, to improve their welfare. And I don't know that uh, an, a whole scale overhaul of the system will not necessarily involve a lot more pain than the incremental approach. Um, so again, it's a question of political philosophy. I, I see the argument for whole systems reform, um, but I think the at the very least there is a place, there's a role for incremental updates somewhere in, in that future. Great, so let's go back to a little bit of the bias um, uh, discussion that you were having earlier. So we get a question here, um, a statement and then a question. The data-based AI will, all, will always accentuate the training data's underlying biases. How do we ensure that AI does not assume binary decision-making as a not looking through the lens of only right and wrong? Hmm. I'm not certain I get the premise of the question. Um, it's not there. There are models that that allow that present besides binary decisions levels of confidence for for the decisions that they, they, they suggest. Um, again, there. OK, so one of the things I didn't quite highlight in, in, in the conversation and where ML systems fit in the system is that even if you have an algorithmic decision making agent, you still have a human factor there. And so oftentimes you'll have a system that presents confidence levels that suggest that the decision is is not that it's not clear that will suggest that it's not it's not certain about whether it's a yes or a no. But because there's a human who has to interpret that decision, it ends up being binarized into a zero one anyway. So there there is a human component, human factors component there. That, that needs to be addressed. It's not just a question of making sure the decisions are not true or false. It's making sure that the operator can understand that there is a great, there is a level of confidence associated with these decisions. Great, let's go into some government discussions here in terms of how they're using AI. And um, we get a, a, a question from uh, Chris Deluzo. Where, if any, do you see government using algorithms or AI with meaningful and effective public oversight? Ah, uh, no. Part of the question there is this issue of what is meaningful, effective public oversight. Um, at the moment, that is a hard question to answer because the the use of advanced machine learning in in government is not as is not as ad advanced as say the use of machine learning decision making in say Silicon Valley. And it's not just a matter of practitioners. It's also a matter of uh, it's, it's also a matter of sophistication of the regulators. Even if you have agencies that are developing really thoughtful machine learning models, we still the oversight mechanism has to understand the nuances of the machine learning decision making process and be able to regulate according to the uh, the value mandate of the of the electorate. Uh, so I guess long story short, I can give you a, a straightforward answer to that. Um, I guess. Another one. So which countries do you feel are leading using AI in government roles? Hmm. I can't give you a good answer to that. <laughs> All right. Um, well, let's talk about the future then. So how prevalent will artificial intelligence be in about five to 10 years? And what will it be used for? What do you what do you think that's not being used for today? Mm. I think the the ambitious scenario I sort of discussed briefly, where you you model a population's response to policy such that you can learn what policies work and what policies don't work. I think that is an area of an area in which machine learning can become really, really, really impactful. So I think we have examples in Silicon Valley of what they call the AI economist. I think it's developed by uh, shoot, it's this, I forget the name of the company, yeah. but they developed a, um, an AI economy. Essentially, is agents behaving using reward maximization principles in an environment where the regulator is is, is modeled by by a reinforcement learning agent, and they try to figure out what are the ways to get at optimal taxation policy in this environment. Um, another way that would be used that that would be useful would be if you're trying, to, for example, in the COVID era, if you're trying to figure out what policies will be ideal, and you have a, a, a 
a faithful or good enough model of how different parts of the population behave. You can run those in the those adaptive policies with the simulated populations in the simulated environment and learn what policies work the best. So I guess long story short, I think, yes, the aspect of, of decision making in, in, in policy making where machine learning models, AI models will become really, really useful in the future in the next five to 10 years. Um, there's also this issue of the AI paradox, I believe it's called, where things that were originally considered AI as they were being developed are no longer considered AI once they become ubiquitous. We have examples of um, fuzzy controllers in train systems across the world in your washing machines. When they were being developed in the 80s and 90s, they were called artificial intelligence. We don't call them that anymore because they're just part of our daily electronic um, ex experience. So. Great, so let's let's talk about private. Now that we've talked about the future, let's talk a bit more about the privacy and what that future might hold for privacy. And and Kenny Chen, Kenny Chen, sorry, um, actually has a great uh, question here. Considering the growing adoption and critique of facial recognition technology, deep fakes, and other algorithms deployed without individuals' knowledge or permission, do you have any insights on how policymakers or companies are trying to better enable consent from those who might be affected by these technologies? Will it require a sea change in data ownership and or privacy regulations, or are there easier, perhaps design-based approaches? Uh, that, is, that is a hard question. Uh, my, my sense is how do we how do we respond as policymakers, decision makers in response to deep fakes or people people's um, privacy is being violated online? I, it's a hard question. It's, it's a question that we, every policy researcher across the country is grappling with. Uh, in, in terms of, so in the spirit of the previous question on whether we should do incremental changes versus wholesale systemic changes, in the spirit of at least a path forward, we have examples of incremental changes on, on online platforms where they flag things that might be considered fake information or information disseminated by bots, they flag those as potentially dangerous such that um, information consumers are more more apprised of what they're being exposed to. So that might be um, ML models are, uh, can be very useful for making that flagging better. Um, in terms of wholesale systemic overhaul to address this issue, um, it's, it's not really so I, here's my concern, especially with the deep fakes um, situation. It's not it's not a situation. It's not a problem that you solve with one shot interventions because it's a it's a it's a war on adversarial um, battle against a against a very motivated adversary. At least in a world in which deep fakes become very very widespread, you're always going to have an adversary who is very interested in creating better and better deep fakes and you have a population who has to get one more sophisticated in discriminating against deep fakes so it, it's the best you can hope for is we provide tools to the population such that they get better at, at recognizing deep fakes and we also improve the level of education in the population such that they are they are more immune so they are more immune to propaganda deep fakes and and all sorts of influence campaign campaigns online so there are no easy answers, in my opinion, on this one. Thanks for that. Um, so can we talk a little bit more about just the limitations and why can't AI define its own limitations? Oh, that's interesting. Why can't AI define its own limitations? I, I'm, I, I'm not clear on the premise of, of that question. Like my mental model for artificial intelligence is it's a technology. Technologies are deployed in an inherently social process. It's not this disembodied thing that exists that continues on its own. So the idea of AI defining its own values seems misguided. Okay. Okay, great. Well, you know, we have time for one more question. Um, and I am um, going to ask, so what more can RAND do with artificial intelligence and governance? Well, we 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 need more. It'd be good as researchers at an independent think tank like Rand to be able to 
do more work that is not based on on a specific agency on a specific client be able to think more broadly about broader interventions broader mechanisms broader audit procedures for doing research on technology at the moment we don't have that we have fo we mostly focus on responding to clients request and part of the whole point of uh, of the campaign the rent campaign is to give researchers more of a leeway to spend time thinking about these systemic issues coming up with solutions and not necessarily be beholden to just individual clients that work is important we need to be able to audit client systems but at some point we need a group of smart independent people to step back look at the whole system and come up with better solutions and i think that's what Rand can spend time on thank you ashande and thank you all for joining us if we didn't get to your question today you can always reach us at rand remote at rand.org i hope you'll participate in our next rand 2020 event on august 20th Laurel Hamilton, RAND's Distinguished Chair in Learning and Assessment, will be our speaker. So stay tuned for more information and for your invitation. Until we can all be together in person, please stay safe, stay well, and stay connected to RAND.